Yes. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started and, um, you know, again, there there will be some others that will join in because of the registration link. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm Matt Carter with the Delaware T-Squared Center, and uh, with us today are also Rusty Lee with the Brexit Center and Sandy Wolf are going to uh, help me out with this. And, uh, you know, we're a little bit new to it here at the center, so we've had a little bit of practice, but uh, uh, hopefully we won't have any technical difficulties. We'll see. We'll get better with it over time. Um, so we're going to talk today about personal protective equipment. This is just an hour-long session. Uh, this is uh, came out of... Um, uh, a session that I've done sort of along the lines of technical assistance uh, presentations for a couple of municipalities in Delaware who uh, increasingly are interested in um, knowing more about personal protective equipment, um, you know, and somewhat uh, stemming out of the work that we do where we do training with the municipal, um, the manual uniform traffic control devices, rather. And... Uh, so sometimes the training we do prompts uh, other needs, which is good, because um, it helps us understand what the needs are. So hopefully uh, we'll find this useful. Uh, it's been useful when I've presented it before, so uh, here goes. So we'll, we'll talk about um, um, uh, quite an array of PPE today. Um, let me... Um, before we jump into it, well, I'll, I'll, I'll wait a moment before I do that and see if we uh, get a couple of others um, online. Uh, as you go along, what I will say is that if you have some questions uh, or things you're not sure I'm going to cover, don't be shy. Drop them in the chat pod, uh, which you should see uh, down at the bottom of your screen, um, and uh, we'll we'll periodically monitor those and get to those. Um, so let's let's talk about and, and again this is this is sort of developed off along the lines of you know local agencies, municipal agencies uh, in particular, but in Delaware of course uh, with Delta uh, maintaining 90% of the roads, um, the operations and maintenance crews there maintain very much of the same kind of activities that the municipalities do and then some. So um, I think that this is is pretty widely uh, applicable uh, to operations and maintenance folks across Delaware. Um, these are the kinds of things that sort of come to mind about activities. There certainly are others, um, but you know we get involved in a lot of different uh, pavement maintenance activities that that you know sort of run the gamut. And whether we do them or we do them with contractors and are overseeing them. Um, you know, and we sort of have the division of responsibility for ourselves and our own crews, and then uh, there are different sort of ways in which the contractor is responsible for their own safety, or we get involved in it, or we set expectations, or those types of things. Um, certainly, I would argue that um, with our contractors, we should uh, set expectations and or set the example, right? So we certainly don't want to be inconsistent uh, with expectations we have for our contractors to have PPE and us show, out, show up either as uh, inspectors or guests or observers or what have you and not uh, be consistent in our use of PPE along that because, you know, the safety culture starts with us, I would argue. So, you know, we have pavement act maintenance activities, curb maintenance activities along similar lines, uh, lots of sign maintenance issues, um, um, mowing of all different kinds, uh, which oftentimes brings us fairly close to the travel lanes, uh, drainage maintenance, whether that's, you know, uh, you know ditch repointing and things like that or best management practices that we're maintaining or whether that's cleaning out stormwater inlets or, um um, jetting uh, pipe culverts or what have you. So, 
Um, you know, there's surely other examples, but, you know, that sort of gets us started in the thinking um, about the kinds of activities. And these are sort of the routine ones, right? There's, there's lots of things that we do less routine, and those are part of why we want to go through some of the PPE that I'm going to talk about here, um, you know, in sort of a high-level way, uh, because some of the activities that we don't always get involved in uh, we maybe aren't as prepared in our thinking about PPE, and we, you know, I'm, I'm hoping I can encourage folks to um, sort of think about those in particular. Um, but we want to think about what PPE is required, um, what's advisable, what's suggested, um, you know, how we go about that, who provides it, uh, do we keep it in stock, do we... Um, you know, do we order it um, as we go? With, you know, uh, th this ought to have a plan and a set of practices like other things that we do. Um, I think in terms of just about everything in life from a risk assessment point of view, I'm a risk management sort of thinker. And so I look at things and I say, well, there's risk associated with everything we do. Um, and we can wring our hands about it and worry about it. Um, that's not very helpful. If you want to wring your hands these days, do it under a, uh, a sink with uh, soap and water, I guess, is, is, is the theme of, of the time. Um, but otherwise, wringing our hands is very useful. We, we're much better off looking at, you know, what are we going to be doing? What are the risks that are involved? And how can we mitigate those risks? And one of the things that I encourage any agency to look at is, particularly with those things that we don't routinely do, is it in our wheelhouse? Do we have the right equipment, the right know-how, and the right PPE for it? If not, perhaps that's something we ought to contract out to a specialty contractor that does do it on a regular basis. So an example of that might be um, uh, tree trimming. Um, maybe that's just not something we do on a regular basis, uh, except in an emergency role, and it's a big tree, it's a tall tree, there's tall branches, it requires uh, lift equipment or things like that uh, that we don't have or that we don't use enough that we feel comfortable with. Uh, part of how we reduce injury is by sort of saying, you know what, this isn't our wheelhouse. Let's, let's get somebody in here that does this. Um, that's hard for a lot of us to do, not just because of finances, but because we like to think that we can handle things. But being smart about that is part of risk assessment in my mind. Um, and so I think, you know, from a management point of view of our activities, just sort of thinking through the activities that we're about to engage in and thinking about risk is, is a good way to go at it. Um, obviously, and we should think about um, not just our own crews, but visitors to the site or people who might be nearby. You know, as opposed to a sort of, say, a building construction or a bridge construction uh, on a new road, like, you know, when 301 was built, where we can sort of control who's nearby. A lot of the work that we're doing on road maintenance, uh, you know, we have the sidewalk superintendents that can wander by. They're curious. They're interested. They're on the sidewalks. Uh, they can be very near where we are. So we want to think about, you know, sort of those civilians um, who aren't protected and how we can reduce their risk by kind of keeping them at bay. We also have visitors to the work site. I mean, maybe the city manager wants to come out and have a look at what we're doing. Uh, that's great. We should encourage the city manager, the mayor, the secretary of DOT, whomever, uh, as a visitor to the site to also uh, don the, the same kind of or at least appropriate PPE uh, for the proximity they're going to be to what we're doing. Uh, the more we think about it in advance, the better we're prepared for it, um, and, and that way we don't have to explain afterwards why something went wrong. So, so let's talk about, let's sort of get into it, and we'll, we'll sort of work backwards, you know, from that, that risk perspective. So this is just sort of a goofy way um, that I like to sort of put together some things. And so we should think about all of the different parts of us that we can injure. 
Um, and most of them are, are fairly straightforward. We certainly think about our head um, and our fingers um, and our legs and what have you, but there's, there's just a whole lot that we can injure. And, you know, perhaps some of the less obvious are things like, uh, you know, uh, damage to our ears or, um, you know, just how many different ways we can injure our eyes and so forth, so forth. So, um, just, just a, a way to sort of get you thinking about, uh, different, um, different parts of the body that we can injure. And if you look closely, you probably will surely find a, a spelling error. So that's, that's homework for everybody. Um, PPE policies are, are something that every agency ought to um, think about and establish, um, at least for the routine sort of things that, that we do. Um, again, exactly what those policies should be uh, are going to differ uh, from agency to agency. There's a risk tolerance that the agency has to decide upon, um, and it should drive what those policies are. Um, you know, again, certainly liability insurance concerns can drive that. Uh, productivity concerns are a reality. You know, I can give you the company line about, you know, uh, it's safety, safety, safety first, but the reality is that productivity concerns come in and even if they don't come in from the agency perspective, they come in from, you know, the, the employee, the worker, uh, uh, the crew member concerned because, you know, he or she have been told, you know, the expectation is that we'll get this done today or this done this week. And, you know, we want to sort of structure our PPE, uh, and we'll talk about this towards the end of this, this presentation, uh, in a way that makes them very comfortable with the PPE and that they don't feel that it's going to inhibit their ability to get the job done. And, of course, most PPE is so much better now than it was years ago. Uh, so take, for example, the, the vest I'm wearing. If you think back to 20 or 30 years ago, um, these things were vinyl, they were hot, they were uncomfortable, and we really, really uh, had a tough time getting a, a lot of workers to wear them. Uh, they're much more comfortable now. They're more aerated, um, and uh, it's you, you really would have to be a curmudgeon to say, "Well, gosh, this is uncomfortable." It shouldn't. Uh, a, a proper safety vest shouldn't get in the way of you getting your work done. And so, those advancements in PPE have helped that a lot. But we should be aware that that you know uh, crew members will have that concern that you know taking the time out for PPE will get in the way of their productivity. And we want to make sure that that we we feel strongly that that you know we have to balance our productivity uh, with safety concerns right up front. Um, we also have to be realistic about things. And again, this is an agency determination. There are agencies that say, I don't care if you're on uh, in a, in a, a cabin closed um, mowing tractor along the road. I still want you wearing a hard hat and safety glasses. Um, Etc. Uh, I'm not saying that's the wrong decision, but you can understand where someone in an air-conditioned cab uh, or a heated cab might, uh, that's fully enclosed might say, what do I need with a hard hat on? So we should think about those things. What, what, what is appropriate? Am I, is there really a risk that, that's realistic that, that I'm protecting against uh, in balance with making that employee comfortable with PPE in general. So again, I don't know what the right answers are. Those are an agency determined, um, but we should give some thought to that and how we create that balance. Uh, yeah, we want to thank Matt. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, sorry, the, uh, the safety vest is a great example. So uh, I'm involved with that national safety group where it has the, basically the safety manager from each state participates for, for the most part and the safety vest like in Delaware, it was pretty clear cut that we're, everyone should be wearing class three um, for our Delaware METCD. But a lot of states, that's a big debate. Do you go class two? Do you go class three? Which, you know, do you go sleeves or no sleeves? And I'm always amazed how, like, that there's some states that have tried to switch and how difficult it can be if, if they've been allowing, you know, a two instead of a three. So that's a good example. I, I do, and and I mean, and again, you know, uh, 
I don't want my sort of, you know, personal view to, to, you know, sort of get in the way of good discussion with agencies. So, I mean, some agencies, for example, uh, uh, don't require their crews uh, to necessarily have safety vests if they have a fluorescent green or orange um, T-shirt on in the summer. Uh, I, you know, I have some difficulties with that, particularly when they're either in or adjacent to the travel way. Um, but that's not my decision to make. Um, you know, of course, in Delaware, um, and Brian and others on the call can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that there's a requirement uh, that says that, you know, it's, it's part of the um, MUTCD in Delaware that um, when you're working in or adjacent to the roadway, you have to wear at least a type uh, uh, ANSI uh, class two safety vest, retroreflective vest. Um, but we'll, we'll let's let's get into that more when we get to that portion of it. But yeah, you're right. That's that that's a at least a good case to think about because it's one of the most common pieces of PPE that we wear. Um, so again, Minnesota developed this great interactive guide. I would draw your attention to it. It's it's a useful thing to use. Uh, it's it's fairly universal. It's not. Um, um, I don't I don't recall when I went through it that it was uh, unique to Minnesota in any way. It does tend to rely very much on OSHA requirements because they are um, an OSHA state uh, or uh, you know an, an OSHA regulated state uh, state plan state. Um, uh, you know, in Delaware, where we are not a state plan state, it's a little bit different, but we tend to uh, refer to and, and uh, sort of defer to, to OSHA standards uh, as sort of our best practices. So it, it, I think it's very applicable. Um, and so it's, it's something we, you know, we provide and we'll, we'll provide the uh, a PDF of these slides to you. Um, after uh, today's presentation, so you have it, and that's just a, a web link you can go to. So I really would encourage you to have a look at that, maybe even print that poster out for, you know, the break rooms. Um, uh, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a handy way to sort of continually draw people's attention to uh, the various forms of PPE that they might consider. And we'll talk about at least most of those in this, this brief training course. Um, and again, this is just an example of how that that particular um, deliverable is is interactive. As you go through and you click on certain things, generally it will take you to an OSHA site specific to that PPE, as you see here. Um, I think I think all of those do drive to an OSHA OSHA uh, web page, if I recall. And so it gives you sort of that the specific quote OSHA requirements, those OSHA standards. Um, and that's at least a good place to start. Uh, this is a, a, a complimentary piece of that uh, where you can use this in a similar fashion where you can look at various activities and look at uh, PPE that are either, you know, essential or suggested. Um, so again, it's just another piece of that deliverable, and I, I won't dwell on it. It's just something that we think is a really good resource, um, and we just wish we'd have thought of it first in Delaware. But uh, we're going to work on some of those things in the future, I think. So here's another uh, uh, goofy uh, sort of uh, graphic um, that, again, we want to think about. You know, so before I was talking about you know things we can injure, and these are some of the things. That we can get, and again, what what's, what I think is constructive about this is that some of these are obvious, um, and some of them are not. I mean, we don't always think, you know, for example, about cramps, right? And so, with uh, it, it's sort of a little bit outside of the PPE range to talk about heat exhaustion and heat heat stress, uh, but but cramps can be part of that, and that's something that we want to advise our personnel to be aware of. Uh, you know, during the hottest parts of the summer, um, and there's ways to mitigate that, right? Drink lots of fluids, um, you know, uh, and, you know, wear, wear, you know, a hat that protects us or, you know, things like that. So, you know, some of that strays a little bit from uh, what we traditionally maybe think of as PPE. <clears throat> but again, thinking about all the different ways that we can injure those parts of the body 
um, or things that can happen to us is, is sort of constructive, I think, as well. So let's sort of step through just a series. And, and again, I'm, I'm going to run through these fairly quickly because a lot of this is um, um, pretty common to our knowledge, but there's some pieces of this that we want to think about that, that maybe we don't always. So when we talk about footwear, um, you know, I think most of us would agree that, that uh, the crew members that are out on the job site, because they don't know what they're going to encounter, uh, certainly ought to be uh, at least encouraged, if not required, to be in uh, work boots, probably steel-toed uh, uh, work boots as a minimum. Um, and then we get into some other things. We get into, well, are the activities that they're going to engage in, do they require that the, the footwear be chemically resistant? Does it need a steel shank in addition to the steel toe? Realizing that, again, this goes back to what we talk about. If I require all of my crew people to wear steel tank, uh, shank, steel toed uh, footwear with metatarsal guards, um, those are heavier, they're maybe hotter, um, and I'm gonna get some pushback from them saying, I don't engage in the kind of activities that require this. So again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. I'm just saying that before we go sort of jumping in with both feet, excuse the pun, um, you know, we should, you know, think about um, whether that's really on balance the right kind of thing to require for all of our people, or should we require that for just folks who uh, are going to be in those kinds of risk categories uh, or at times of the year when they're going to be in those risk categories. So, uh, you know, footwear is, is one that, that there are uh, just a whole host of options to think about, um, and so it's a good one to start with. Uh, pants and shirts. So we touched on this just a little bit briefly. I mean, uh, so some agencies allow during the summer uh, their crew members to wear shorts, uh, as a, you know, from their viewpoint, as a practical matter, uh, others say, nope, long pants all year round. We want to make sure that you have at least that level of protection, um, you know, for your calves and what have you. Um, long sleeves or shorts. Um, I've come across agencies that require long sleeve shirts all year round, um, you know, at least for some activity of folks. So if you have a welder, uh, for example, that, that perhaps would be understandable. Um, and that maybe that's not even enough that you would want fire resistant um, long sleeve shirts. Um, again, I would argue that this should come back to well, what are the activities you're going to be engaging in? Certainly, with activities like welding, I think ramp that up a little bit. Um, you know, doing weed eating and, and mowing and things might very well uh, say that nope, you're going to have to be in long pants. And for some agencies, there's there's sort of a one size fits all idea, which is, well, there are people that I can allow to wear shorts, but others I have to require to wear long pants because of their activities, and so I don't want to get pushed back from some, so everybody has to. Again, that's not a wrong policy. Um, if that's you know the sort of nature of uh, what you have to do, then 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 you drive it that way. Um, so here, you know, Brian was talking about this earlier, hinting to it, and, and so, you know, this is from the Delaware MUTCD, and so, you know, this is something that um, some of the municipalities I've come across in my travel uh, haven't necessarily been aware of, that, you know, that, I mean, this, this is, you know, the, the Delaware MUTCD finds its foundation in the Delaware Code. It applies uh, not just to DELDOT, but to all, all agencies that work in the right-of-way. And if they're exposed to traffic um, or work vehicles and what have you, then they have to wear, they shall wear high visibility safety apparel that meets um, at least uh, class two, anti class two uh, uh, high visibility safety vests. So, um, you know, this, this is not widely understood. I, I think it's probably widely understood in DelDot. Um, uh, because of, of the safety managers there, but uh, in some of the other agencies, this is not as understood as I would hope it would be, uh, given uh, how many times Rusty and I have presented uh, METCD training and, and cover this. Um, and of course, flaggers are required, uh, at least in Delaware, to wear uh, class three 
uh, ANSI uh, safety vests. Um, and again, we tend to think of this as, you know, well, you know, class two is without the sleeves, class three um, is with the sleeves. Um, that's probably close enough for our purposes, uh, but, you know, there are, it, it really is driven by how much uh, fluorescent background material and how much um, uh, um, retro, or retroreflective or reflective material is the term they use. Um, uh, material that's on it. Um, I, a lot of agencies sort of cut to the chase and say, we're just going to order ANSI 3 vests and be done with it. Uh, I would tend to encourage that. Um, but again, that's that's a policy decision that needs to be made at the agency level. Um, with with high-vis apparel, uh, there are some questions about wintertime where, uh, you know, for me, because I'm not out every day in the winter. Um, uh, in fact, you know, it's, it's sporadic at best. Um, it's fine for me to wear a Carhartt jacket and I have, well, let's just say a larger than normal um, uh, uh, class three vest uh, that fits over top of it. Uh, it's not the most convenient thing in the world, uh, but it's, it's fine for my purposes. Uh, for some agencies, they say, I, I, you know, in order to encourage my folks uh, to have that apparel on, uh, I don't want to take the chance and I'm going to issue, uh, you know, retroreflective uh, parkas or, you know, uh, work coats or whatever term you want to use. Again, this is a choice you can go through. Certainly, it makes it uh, easier um, to don one piece of apparel rather than two. Uh, and so it has some merits. But again, that's an agency decision. Let's talk about gloves a little bit. So, um, so I like to do some uh, visual aids with this. I'll try it via Zoom. Um, so there's there's all kinds of gloves. Uh, so I don't know whether you can see these. So these are a really snazzy pair of uh, gloves that have never been used. I got them from the West Virginia LTAP Center when I taught a course over there a couple of years ago and just haven't gotten around to actually use them. Um, there's a similar kind of pair that they actually do use. Um, you can see they're dirty and everything. Um, actually do do work on occasion. Um, but I mean, so those are one type of glove, but you know, we have these sort of, uh, oops, get them over here, sort of grippy style gloves that, you know, a lot of us use. These um, these have come down in price quite a bit and are, are really, really handy uh, for a lot of different tasks we would be in. Um, you can have very simple gloves like that. These are just sort of cotton knit gloves um, that, that are, you know, sort of almost intended to be at least close to one use. So, um, you know, they can be handy for certain activities. Uh, we have leather work, work gloves like those that can be used. So, I mean, there's, you know, there's those, but of course, as you see here, there's also sort of what I would call more specialty gloves. There's gloves that are specifically intended for different kinds of activities. And this is where before, like when I was talking before, were about, you know, sort of maybe those activities that we don't as, as often get involved in or that only parts of our crew do. Welders should have specific welder gloves because of the dangers involved in that. If we have electric uh, folks working with electrical, um, not only do we want uh, special electric, you know, gloves meant for those folks, but we want to go through um, the uh, routine daily testing procedures to make sure that there are no even pinholes in those. That's a whole other topic for another day. There are great videos online about high voltage um, uh, uh, safety practices where they get into that. But that's one of those areas where not only, you know, uh, you know, maybe your general purpose glove that has a little bit of a hole in one finger isn't so bad. Uh, when it comes to electrical work, uh, there's almost no point in having those electrical gloves if you're not going to literally test them every day because even a pinhole can, can mean a difference in your safety. They have cut-resistant gloves. <clears throat> Excuse me. It goes on and on. One of the things that is a surprise to some workers and some managers is that um, the, uh, the proper sizing of gloves matters. Um, and... Uh, really, if you stop to think about it, first of all, gloves come in different sizes. And uh, figuring out how to size them, there's an example here. You can find this with a lot of producers of, of gloves and, and distributors of gloves. You can find uh, 
different uh, uh, sizing charts that will help you. This again comes back to if I if I just order one size of gloves for the whole crew, the general purpose gloves, um, then some of them may not wear them because the fingers are too long, uh, or it's too hard to get in and out of them because they're too small for their uh, big hands. Um, we should if we want them to wear those gloves and protect themselves, then we should make uh, some some pretty concerted efforts to make sure that we have the right kind of gloves for them in the right sizes. Um, it, it, it this is a, a theme that will echo with with other PPE as well. If we want them to wear it, it should be reasonably comfortable. They should fit well. Uh, we'll come back to that towards the end of this a little bit. Um, so let's talk about hard hats a little bit. So um, so. Uh, this is a bad example of a hard hat, um, and not just because it looks bad on my great big head, right? Uh, more, more to the point, um, this is, well, I probably shouldn't say it, but I'll say this is okay for me um, because uh, I, I, I don't come in a lot of close contact uh, with this kind of risk. But if I started to do that, I would be concerned about that. Why is that? Well, it's a perfectly acceptable hard hat. Um, you know, it has our logo on the front and everything, or the DCT logo anyway. Um, and But what the problem with it is, is this was bought in 2008 or nine, I think. Um, these things don't improve with age. And it's one of the uh, problems uh, out there. There's... It's a funny thing with construction workers particularly, but even, you know, folks on operations and maintenance crews, um, they, um, they don't um, – uh, they like to hold on to their hard hats. They put all kinds of stickers from projects on it and things, and it's sort of badges of courage and, and, and whatnot, and they, um, they hold on to them, and they shouldn't. They should be replaced uh, on a regular basis. They should be replaced when they're damaged. Um, and and so on. So I, I I won't sort of go on and on about it, but that's a common misconception or misunderstanding about hard hats. Um, let me stop here because I made a mistake in the beginning, and uh, in that I didn't I but well I sort of put it off and then I forgot about it. But now that we have um, sort of a, a fuller contingent on the call, um, let me. Um, let me stop for just a moment, and I want to just do a, uh, a, two quick polls that I'd ask you to do. So um, I'm going to launch this poll first. This is a, a, a just a multiple choice. You can pick any of these. But if, if everybody on the call could just go ahead and answer that poll and um, tell us, you know, what your role with personal protective equipment is. Can you all see that? Okay. There, oh, apparently so. There you go. So we're getting close. Just a couple more of you. Okay. So I want to just do that and and share that. So um, so uh, not surprising by who's on the call. Um, you know, a lot of you supervise and and, and monitor that. Um, but again, you know, different folks, some, some folks just, they just wear it, right? And um, so uh, others of us are sort of the ones that ought to try to help them know what uh, PPE uh, is appropriate for what they're doing and sort of do our best to encourage that they, um, that they do do it. Let me do one other quick one before we proceed. Uh, oh, stop sharing. And let me just do this one. So this is anonymous, um, but um, but so in your in your agency, do you feel like uh, adequate consideration is given by your agency for PPE uh, for the various activities? So 
I'm going to share that out. So everybody says yes, and that's good. Um, we're going to have one more poll at the end, and um, that will come back and sort of uh, – sort of build off of that but let me go back to oops go back to here so um so we're talking about hard hats let's move on uh, again with hard hats just one last point on that so again this is uh something where we should uh ask ourselves who's required to wear hard hats when it you know again some agencies every day whenever you're out of the truck whenever you're out of the equipment Sometimes when you're in the equipment, um, again, I'm, it's not for me to say what the right policies of your agency uh, are, but I think giving some consideration to that, and, and I would say uh, base it on risk once again. Um, so safety glasses. So um, this is just one example, of course. There's lots and lots of styles um, and, and, and functionality. Um, these are a little bit dirty for some reason. They've been here in the garage for too long. Um, um, so let me take those off. Put the buttons back on. Um, but, you know, safety glasses come in a lot of different styles. Now, this has become a real fashion statement for a lot of folks. Um, and sort of the old, you know, there's many of them just are not going to wear the old safety goggles. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of them, uh, for most tasks, aren't particularly good because they fog up so badly, although certainly they've gotten better. Um, these style, like I see here, or, or you know, similar ones, um, are oftentimes much more comfortable, um, very effective. But again, for some of the tasks that we might be doing, uh, these might not be good enough. We may need something more akin to a safety goggle. Certainly when you're doing torch work and things like that, um, then, uh, you know, something that, that, that wraps around the, the eye portion of the face better, like uh, more akin to goggles, is probably a better thing. If you're doing work with um, crack sealing or crack filling, um, uh, you probably uh, uh, will want to have face shields. Uh, it, it's, that's certainly a best practice, best safety practice for that activity. Uh, with chainsaw work, a lot of agencies require that a face shield be worn. So, again, depending on the kinds of things you're doing, uh, you know, a, a pair of safety glasses like we see here uh, might be fine for everyday uh, functions, but we ought to think about those um, unusual activities. Um, and, again, we should, we, you know, we should ask ourselves. There are some agencies, certainly some contractors, you will always have safety glasses on all the time. Um, the other part that we won't dwell on, but of course there's the prescription con concept. Um, people who uh, have prescription eyeglasses may need prescription safety glasses, and so we want to have a policy for how we deal with that. Um, hearing protection. So again, this is the kind of thing that this is not arbitrary. We don't do it by gut feel, or we shouldn't. Um, when it, we, we ought to go and look at what the OSHA standards are for this. And they provide basically it's the idea of sort of um, the, uh, the 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 uh, the the elevation of of noise uh, in terms of decibels uh, and the uh, time of exposure. So you could have a somewhat elevated uh, decibel level that would be tolerable for a short period of time. You could have a, a lower uh, decibel level that uh, over an eight-hour day says, no, you, you should have hearing protection for that. So we ought to think about the activities and the kind of decibel levels that are going to be there and the, um, the duration uh, and proximity to that that, that the worker is going to have so that we can decide whether uh, hearing protection is needed for those tasks and those personnel um, and then what kind. Uh, respiratory protection. We have talked a lot about this uh, lately, um, and so be right back. I didn't prepare as well as I thought I had. So, so we've talked a lot about these lately. These whoops, N95 masks. Can't see that very well, but that's fine. Um, um, 
the host has spotlighted your video for everyone. I'm not sure what that means. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm not sure what that is. Anyway. Um, I could hear you. Okay, good. So, uh, you know, there's all kinds of respiratory protection. And it ranges from just a simple dust mask, which, you know, until recently, um, you know, was basically what we thought of as a face mask. Uh, but um, there, we sh again, we should have the right masks for the right tasks. If we're working with fumes and vapors and things, we need a very different kind of face mask or, res or even respirator. Uh, we should not confuse... Um, sort of a standard dust mask as being protective in those environments. Uh, if we have silica environments and, and other fine particle kind of things, we ought to be at least at an, an N95 kind of mask for those activities if we're going to be involved with them for any period of time. Um, and again, these have a shelf life as well, uh, whether it's, you know, just simple masks like uh, we've been talking about, um, you know, with those. Uh, those rubber bands don't last forever. The mask might be fine as long as it's kept in its packaging. But so, for example, the package I showed you a minute ago has been laying around in my garage uh, for some period of time. And when I snagged one of them a few weeks ago and took it out of the packaging uh, and put it on my big meaty head, uh, the first thing that happened was one of the two rubber bands snapped. And that wasn't very surprising because I think I bought those masks when the Ebola virus came out uh, a number of years ago. So these things don't last forever. Um, and so we shouldn't buy, uh, not that we could right now, uh, but we shouldn't buy 10,000 of them and put them uh, in the shop and imagine that we've got, you know, a 20-year supply because when we get around to using them, they're probably not going to do very well. By the same token, the cartridges that go in actual full face or partial face respirators, uh, these have shelf lives off. And so we should pay attention to this. So um, there's, there's more on that topic, but in the interest of time, we'll, we'll move on here. Um, so we've all heard the term N95 mask lately. Um, but again, uh, some of that, and, and again, a lot of us have gotten much more uh, educated about the topic lately, but you know, what does N95 mean? Well, here's, here's exactly what NIOSH means by that. These have real meanings. And again, the N in that, uh, which hasn't been talked about as much, is that it's not resistant to oil. And so again, if we're going to be involved in activities that are going to involve the splatter of, of oils or, or hydraulic fluids or things like that, um, then we might want to be in an R90, R95 type mask or what have you, or even a P. Uh, so again, there's more than meets the eye about respiratory protection. And depending on what our activities are, uh, if they're not the routine kind of thing, we probably want to up our game with that stuff and certainly start with an understanding of what these different uh, respiratory protection devices are for uh, and, and how they meet the risk. Uh, we, you also should be mindful that there's a lot of fraudulent uh, respiratory protection equipment out there and other equipment. Uh, you don't have to wonder and you don't have to guess. NIOSH does a pretty good job uh, with their certified equipment list. Uh, again, you'll see uh, these hyperlinks in the PDF that we send you after this. Uh, you can go right there. Uh, you look at, you'll, you'll see on the, the example I have here, uh, on that mask, there's a TC number. You can enter that into their database, and they will tell you whether it's certified or not. Um, so we, and, and what that means is, is that they've tested that equipment and it does what it's supposed to do. If it's not in their database, they don't know. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so chats. Um, again, this is something that, uh, um, you know, increasing, I think a lot of us are aware of. Um, they're much more comfortable. Um, they're, uh, you know, it's still a bit of a chore sometimes to get folks to wear them. Uh, if we are working with chainsaws, uh, we should encourage the use of these, the proper use of these. Um, uh, it's remarkable how effective they are. Um, uh, one of the things to be aware of with chaps that's not always known is when you buy a new pair, 
uh, and over time, they should actually be washed. They should be washed before their first use. And the reason for that is uh, that the material fluffs up um, be, be through the washing process. Uh, again, you should look at the manufacturer's uh, requirements for that and look at that. But I think you'll find that any of them you buy do encourage they be washed and dried beforehand so that they're uh, at their most effectiveness. Uh, if you haven't seen a, a video like this one, um, sort of in the lower center of the screen, uh, it's worth seeing just how uh, remarkably effective a proper set of chaps can be in terms of protecting you and stopping the chain uh, instantaneously. Um, fall protection, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because this is not part of a lot of us, uh, certainly in terms of every day. Construction workers on bridge projects and other structures, increasingly it is, which is a nice thing to see in the construction industry. Um, but uh, the, the, the one thing I wanna sort of just dwell on for a moment about fall protection is, is it's not for show. Uh, if, if you need fall protection, you need fall protection for you. It needs to be uh, fitted to you. Um, it has a shelf life. Uh, if it is damaged or worn, it you cannot rely on it to protect you. So if we're going to be providing fall protection equipment, uh, we need to make sure that we've got a regular process to inspect it uh, and replace it and take care of it. Um, you know, OSHA uh, is confused on the topic um, or, or creates confusion because they uh, they sort of run you all over the place. I've tried to help you a little bit here about where, at least in terms of their idea, where fall protection requirements apply and where they don't. Um, um, you know, again, uh, you know, I won't, I won't spend a lot of time on this, um, but, it, you know, I, I think it, those, those references are worth digging into a little bit. And if anybody has any problems with those, uh, let me know. I'm happy to help you sort of walk through some of that. Um, again, you know, uh, OSHA always sort of talks about what it doesn't cover and then eventually gets to what it does cover. Uh, they run you all over the place a little bit. Again, if you get lost in this, I'm happy to help you with it. I've done some, some deep dives into that. Uh, body protection, right? So, uh, again, particularly for municipal work, uh, that I can think of where we get involved in waste collection, beach cleanup, um, uh, painting, chemical use, things like that. Uh, we should think about this, and we don't always, right? I mean, perhaps we should have with waste collection people, for example, uh, maybe they ought to have some kind of uh, soil oil resistant coveralls issued to them. Um, you know, um, you know, again, a regular pair of jeans those materials seep through, and then you have some exposure to that. Um, again, it's just something to think about. Uh, some activities we ought to really up our game and we ought to be in some kind of uh, Tyvek or, or polypropylene or, or some kind of protective coveralls uh, to kind of keep the bulk of, of uh, that, those contaminants off of us. Um, so, you know, this is the kind of personal protective equipment we've talked about, at least uh, we've talked about most of this. So again, just another way of, uh, you know, some of these we haven't talked about. We, talked, we haven't talked about bug spray, right? So that's not something we necessarily think about in terms of PPE, but um, I, I think at least generously we can think of it um, as being that. So, um, so, you know, think about the myriad of, uh, of examples of PPE uh, that we ought to at least think about, and particularly those that are sort of not our everyday thing, because I think those are the ones that in some ways are easier to forget about or overlook or, or not do as well as we should. A um, couple of quick examples. Um, here's, here's where I, I tongue in cheek say, you know, it's, it's time to critique and second guess other people who are actually working. Um, and so that's the luxury of the job I'm in now is I don't have to actually work uh, I just watch other people work and and ask questions like, is that is that really the way you want to do that? Um, uh, and so uh, it, it's a good gig if you get the chance, I guess is what I would say. Um, but let's so let's take a look at this. You know, here we've got some sort of typical curb and sidewalk stuff. Um, 
so the things that, that sort of pop out at me is you've got, you know, at least most of the people that I see working in these, in these pictures, uh, they're wearing uh, at least some form of retroreflective clothing, um, probably, probably at least class two. Um, uh, they've got boots on. They've got knee pads. We didn't talk about those. Um, um, uh, most of them, most of them have gloves on. Um, and one of the things that we don't think about a lot of times with concrete work, uh, I do see folks who are finishing concrete barehanded. If you're doing that every day, um, that can create some real problems for you. And so, again, we should at least, I think, offer them the opportunity for those um, personal protective equipment, uh, if not require it. The thing I don't see here is that we've got traffic immediately adjacent to these workers. Their backs are to that traffic. Um, and, you know, I took these photos, so I was there, and I know that they didn't have any kind of uh, temporary work zone set up. They didn't have, you know, uh, cones out along the parking aisle and things like that. Uh, and so it concerned me just a little bit. But that's probably, aside from the guy in the upper right that's carrying a, a form with no gloves, um, you know, that, you know, I could nitpick at things like that and say, ah, you know, why aren't you? Um, again, um, that's the worst I could probably say about this. Um, uh, some more curb and sidewalk here. Um, you know, uh, I don't know whether you've ever seen a concrete chute uh, swing and, and hit somebody in the head. I did when I was a young man, uh, first starting out in construction. Uh, luckily, he was wearing a hard hat. It's a long story, but it was a goofy, comical hard hat. But nonetheless, um, he was wearing it, and it managed to catch it, and I think it saved his life. It, the chute caught him and threw him, uh, I would say, about 15 to 20 feet, uh, and he was unconscious uh, uh, for a few minutes, uh, but was largely fine. Uh, these things swing around, they get a lot of speed, and they've got some weight. And so, you know, with uh, concrete and curb work, we might think, well, why do I need to wear a hard hat? Well, you're around stuff that's over your head that can, that can hurt your noggin. So, um, you know, uh, it, it's, that's why I think you see these folks wearing hard hats. A um, little bit more on curb and sidewalk. Aside from the fact that these, these guys are really overworking the surface of this concrete, again, uh, with, with all these extra joints, that's not their fault. It's the, the, the sort of theme that the city wanted, um, uh, and that's a topic for another training course anyway. Um, you know, what... What do you see here? Well, the, it might be a bit of a trick question. Um, and the, 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 the trick is, is that notice, that, you know, in the lower left, notice that the, 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 the guy on the lower left is wearing gloves. Uh, the guy on the right is not. Um, you know, this is a guy that was out there, you know, while I was out there for an hour or two, was finishing concrete, uh, was handling concrete with his bare hands, et cetera. Uh, probably a guy that does this every day. Uh, he probably ought to have gloves on to protect his skin, um, you know, uh, because it's, again, it's a constant exposure. Uh, if I handle concrete for, you know, 10 minutes on a, on a home project, maybe, maybe that's not the biggest deal in the world. But, uh, but here I think that we should be wearing gloves. Um, pavement repair. So here, you know, we've got folks in, you know, retroreflective, uh, vests. We've got hard hats. Um, they're all wearing gloves. Um, you know, there's, we see evidence of some temporary traffic controls to protect them a little bit. Um, uh, so, you know, these are the kinds of things that probably would be good practices uh, and we ought to encourage, if not out, outright require. Um, you know, the guys in the right here are doing some crack sealing or crack filling. Um, you know, uh, again, lots of safety vests, uh, no hard hats, but again, maybe there's no need out there. Uh, I'd be a little concerned about the guy running the crack ceiling wand that he doesn't have a face shield on. Um, uh, certainly if there's somebody running a hot air lance or a uh, high pressure uh, uh, blowout hose, uh, I, I would like to see uh, at least eye protection, if not a, 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 um, a, a face mask. Um, the guys on the left don't seem to have a real high 
uh, value in, in safety. Um, I, I don't, other than, than what might be cowboy boots, I don't really see much there. So, again, not to be overly critical, but that's not how I would run my crew, I guess. Um, so let me, uh, we're, we're running close on time here, just a couple more minutes. Uh, I want to just run uh, one more, um, run more poll real quick. Um, and there you go. Um, and this sort of picks up on the, um, oops, oops, I got to get in my third poll. So this picks up off of the third one. So I, I guess thinking back on that earlier poll uh, and what we've discussed, do you think some of your activities require PPE that you haven't necessarily had on hand? Uh, or do you think that some enhancements might be needed in your agency? So, uh, and I should have posted that before I started reading it to you, but that's, that's the question. So if you can kind of weigh in on that a little bit. Everybody still awake? There we go. Getting there. Okay. I'm going to end that and share that. So 50-50, right? Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I thought maybe we'd get a lot of uh, to think on that, but, um, and maybe with a larger crowd we might have. But um, um, but you know, hopefully what we've talked about here uh, will sort of make you, you, you think a little bit uh, about that and whether you've got what – oops, I went to the wrong one. Uh, bear with me. Um, I went to the wrong one. Huh. Oh, well. We'll do this. See if I can get there. So, well, while I try to navigate to that last one, um, I will uh, I'll simply say that the last thing that we wanted to talk about was sort of fit and comfort. And so we've alluded to this as we've gone along, but um, I'm almost ready to share that screen. There we go. Um, yeah. So, so again, I've talked about this just a little bit as we went along, but uh, regardless of your policies and what you do and don't require and when you do, um, I really want you to think about fit and comfort because they really can make a difference. If we want people to wear PPE uh, and wear it correctly, we should try to make sure that it fits them, that it's reasonably comfortable. It doesn't mean that we have to go out and buy the best of the best of the best always, but uh, if you know this style of gloves fits them better, and is more effective and costs a little bit more, well, then maybe that's a good choice if our end goal really is to encourage them to wear it. Um, you know, we want stuff that'll, that they can, when they don it, it will stay on. So think about folks, for example, that we want to wear hard hats, but they do a lot of bending over work. Well, then, you know, we need to offer them the opportunity of uh, a chin strap or uh, hard hats that stay on their head better than perhaps just sort of the, the least effective hard hat we can issue them. Um, and we want to make sure that we monitor shelf lives on these things. Uh, hard hats don't last forever. Gloves don't last forever. Um, we should make sure that we, we replace these as, as we go along. Um, so that's all I have here. Again, that's, it's a pretty quick run through. I'm right at 12. Just give me a second. We'll, we'll wrap up here. Um, but, you know, if you have questions about this, that's what we're here for. We're happy to be a resource for you. Uh, reach out to me or Sandy or Rusty. Um, and, you know, if, if we don't know, we're happy to dig in and research topics for you, whether it's PPE or other issues. So um, with that, I, I want to be mindful of time. Are, are there any questions that have come up or comments or you guys want to correct me on anything? I'm happy to hear it. Um, Rusty, if you can, if you're able to unmute everybody, that would probably be good. Okay. 
Uh, did we have any any questions in the chat pod that, that we should get to? Nope, nothing came up, Matt. Okay. All right. Last last chance to criticize anything I said. I'm I'm a big boy and I can take it. I thought it was pretty good, Matt. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciated it. Great. Well, yeah, we'll you, let you go. We'll let you go then. We hope you're all obviously doing well and, and being productive. Um, call us if we can help on anything. We're happy to be a resource to you, um, and please pass the word. If anybody needs anything, we'll, we, we want to be the best resource we can for you. Um, have a good day. Have a good weekend. Take care, everybody. Thanks again. You too. Thanks. You too. Stay safe. All right.